We missed you last week. Started. Ready? Yes, Brother? sir. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to start our service. You can stand if you can, if you feel like standing. We're going to begin with number 289. Brother Doug is going to lead. And I'm going to sit down just for a few minutes. There shall be showers of blessing. Um, number 289. It's not in your. It's not in your bulletin. Sorry about that. But we are going to do 289. Uh, there shall be showers of blessing. And yeah, let's. let's start. Yes, sir. Page 289. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us start falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valley, sound of the abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers blessings we need. Mercy just round just start falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, send them upon us the Lord. Grant you a now a refreshing, come and now on your word. Shall shall be showers of blessing, oh that today they might fall, now as to God we're confessing, now on the Savior we call, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need, mercy just round us our fall. see everybody out this morning as I said before let's uh, begin and continue our worship with prayer so let's pray together Heavenly Father we're so thankful for the opportunity to be a part of your family to be uh, in a place of worship in a country that allows it Amen. to be done freely Lord we're thankful that um, everyone that could be here is here today we pray for those that aren't with us today uh, just for various reasons. Take care of them, Lord, and I pray that you'd see them back here next Sunday. I pray for those who are traveling. I pray for those who are doing difficult things, uh, taking care of family. I pray for, especially for the Dell family. Lord, I pray just lift them up as they take care of uh, Christine's mom. Just be with her, Lord. We pray for healing in her body. Take care of her, Lord, and lift her up. Help Sam as he travels. I believe he's traveling, or he's home today. And just take care of him as he gets ready for Monday. Uh, just be with this family, and we pray for healing. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd help us as we worship you, that we would do it with hearts of love and joy and 
thanksgiving because of all the great things that you do for us on a daily basis. Lord, uh, you're there for us. And Lord, sometimes there's difficulties, but Lord, your comfort and the joy that we can get because of your presence in our lives is amazing. We're thankful for it. We pray that we would, we would live this more. Lord, help us. It's not easy. But we ask for your help in the present. Help us as we continue to worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's continue. Number 307. Number 307 is the next song. 307. Send the light. Since you're not here, you're out there, you can send the light. <laughs> There's a call come ringing over the restless way. Send the light, send the light. There's a soul to rescue, there's a soul to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine, the short to show. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine. From shore to shore, we have heard the Macedonia call today. Send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the light, send the, light. the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light. Rest of God for life, let it shine from shore to shore. Let us pray that grape may everywhere about send the light, send the light, and the Christ like spirit everywhere we found. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the rest of God for life, let it shine. From shore to shore, send the light, the best of God for light, let it shine from shore to shore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love, send the light, send the light, let it gather you for a crown of love, send the light, send the light, send the light. Bless the God for light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, bless the God for light, let it shine from shore to shore. Now, we were just commenting about our hymn book, which sometimes likes to edit things. So, you know, the thing they edited in the song, the last phrase of the song. It's not sure to sure. What is it? Forevermore. Forevermore. Like, I don't know how the editors, you know, because I know that's the original word, but I don't understand why they did that. Like, maybe it was some 15-year-old, no, maybe a 22-year-old that never sang hymns their entire life, and they, they just forgot. Like, I feel, I feel like it was, a, it was just an oversight, like, because they, as they were editing, they wanted to put that repeat sign in there, and so... They just said, well, it must be from shore to shore. And then somehow the person that came after them that edited it missed it too. Mm. It's what forevermore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we sing it. Yeah. Yeah. You're not doing it any favors by repeating the same phrase over and over And there you have it from a literary scholar, Caleb, with his <laughs> bachelor's <laughs> degree in uh, <laughs> writing. And he's right, though. You're right, Caleb. Totally right. Uh, yeah, add a little variety to your writing. So, but forevermore is just better. And shore to shore is okay. You sing the first verse, yeah, that's good. The first part, shore to shore, but then expands it like from shore to shore. Okay, now let's go on land. You know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, anyway, I hear the I hear these songs. This hymnal is kind of a uh, not one of the old fashioned kind of hymnals. Kind of a modern publisher that did it, but you know. It was, it was written in like 1991, so it's, now it's getting old. And you go through this, and every once in a while there's a phrase that they just change. You know, Like, they get rid of Ebenezer from come thou fount of ever blessing. Like, why did you do that? I love that word. It's, it's such a meaningful word that if you do a little research on it. But anyway, whatever, no big deal. 
They don't change the meaning of the song for us. Okay, it's so good to have everybody here this morning as we worship the Lord. I'm so glad you could be here. Uh, let's take a look at our, our um, bulletin today. A couple things in there I want to point out to you. Uh, we praise the Lord that the numbers are going down for COVID-19, which is good. I hope that means people will be coming back. I actually got a, I had a chat with a person who actually went to Bob Jones before I did. She lives in Barstow, California, and she lived there all her life. And she was moving to Bullhead City to be with her son, who lives in Mojave Valley. And she said, I'm really interested in your church. I play piano, and I want to be involved in the music ministry. And, but uh, she said, after this stuff starts to, you know, probably after she got, got the vaccine and she feels comfortable, she said, I'll be there. So I'm looking forward to that. Also talked to a seminary student from the Southern Seminary, which is Albert Moeller's. He's the president of that seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, a young man just got his Master's of Divinity. It's way more schooling than I've ever had. And uh, he's excited about serving the Lord. And he said, I want to I wanna get to close, as close to California as I can. And Bullard City seemed like the best town on the border. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to move there. I said, well, you have a job? No. Um, do you have a place to minister? He says, no. So I don't know that they'll come to our church. But it was kind of cool talking to him. His name is Lucas. Pray for him. Because maybe it's not God's will for him to be at our church but to say that you want to come to Bullhead City and minister and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's this guy that probably could be employed as a youth pastor anywhere in America with a Master of Divinity from Southern Seminary. That's a huge thing. And he says, I want to come to Bullhead. So I'm like, right on. That's really, really cool. So, uh, so when he prayed for Lucas and his family that uh, God leads them. And as we look towards... You know, God working in the lives of our people, hopefully people feeling comfortable to come back to the church house. Uh, I did say, I did ask mention in the prayer uh, to pray for uh, Sam and Christine, uh, uh, Christine's mom. Um, she, on Wednesday, she broke her shoulder and then she went and had surgery and they had her back. They, had, they gave her a shoulder replacement and then she fell again and broke the other arm. Uh, this morning or yesterday last night I guess so just very difficult she's you know in her she's very old she's uh, very old and uh, dealing with some difficulty so let's pray for um, Christine's mom her name is Rose I believe so let's pray for Christine's mom and anyway uh, oh in, in the bulletin one other thing Wednesday March 3rd if you want to join with us Facebook messaging still seems to be the best way for us to meet and uh, we've had some faithful people being there, and it's so good to spend time with them in prayer. And then our church beautification day, there is no day listed. But right now, I'm really wanting to do it on Saturday, this coming Saturday. And we need to clear out all of the Christmas stuff that's still in the, the room. There's some yard work that needs to be done. There's some touch-up paint that I'd like to do. Just some, some things. And hopefully, as we see people come back to church, we're going to see people come to our place. And hopefully they're going to go, wow, it's a great place to be. So if you'd like to help us out with that, it would be awesome. We'll probably start at 10 a.m. and we'll probably go till about 3 p.m. So that's our plan. Hopefully this Saturday. If not, it'll be maybe the next Saturday or even possibly during next week, during the week, because I'm off and the boys are off, uh, my, my team of uh, ministry boys. They'll be off, and so hopefully they can help me if we can't do it on the Saturday. So... Uh, We'll, we'll post and we'll let all of you know about when that will happen. And then I want to encourage you, those back home, you can give online at PayPal. Our email is trinitybullhead at sitlink.net. Our website is trinitybullhead.com. You can find any of this information there. I try and keep up with it. Almost all of the messages have been posted there. If you want to go back and watch one of the old ones, or one, maybe you want to watch Stuart on there. He's, his message, I think, is there. Um, and... Uh, and all of our messages since COVID started are there. So if you'd like to take a look at those, you can. And then we're continuing our messages in Revelation this week. I'd like to take our offering. Heavenly Father, Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to get bless us as we give more than we need it for the sake of God we pray in your name. Amen. Before I pass the plate, I just want to let you know that um, Sarah has a uh,
about I said camp scholarship day on Saturday so when we do have the work day those of you who are planning on going to camp if you're here and you're working we'll take some of your camp fee off as part of our kind of summer um, our summer uh, summer camp scholarship program which we do so okay all right we're gonna do a couple more songs and Let's see, I need someone to, Sarah, can you operate the mouse for me, please? Here we go. Okay. We're going to do Jesus, thank you. So you guys can join in once I get the words up here. If I can do that. Here we go. All right. Jesus, thank you. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. Agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your son. Drank the bitter cup reserved for me. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. By sacrifice I've been brought near. Enemy, you've made your friend. Pouring out the riches of your glorious grace. Your mercy and your kindness know no end. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Lover of my soul, I want to live for you. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. 
Jesus, thank you. You know what? I was going to do this. So, because um, we're singing, we're, we're reading about the new song in Revelation 5. So I had picked the song I was going to do, uh, Across the Lands. And then I decided, no, I'm going to do this song because it's an echo song. You guys just have to echo with me. And maybe you know it. It goes like this. Yeah, it's all echo. So here we go. Ready? It goes like this. I sing a new song. I sing a new song since Jesus came. Serve a new master. Wear a new name. Walk a new road. Have a new goal. Know a new peace. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. We gotta do this again, right? It's perfect. Here we go. I sing a new song since Jesus came. Serve a new master, wear a new name, walk a new road, have a new goal. Know a new peace down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. That's for the bass singers, you know. Down deep in my soul, you know. Down. Okay, good. That was fun. Sometimes you got to do the fun songs, right? Oh. Okay, let me unplug this. Okay. Okay, missing my ministry and singing crew, although it was really great to have Brother Doug to be a part today. I appreciate him so much. And today we are going to look at Revelation chapter 5. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5, that would be awesome. Revelation 5, and we just, we just observed the throne room. We observed the throne room last week, if you remember, and there were the 24 elders, and they bow down and they worship the Lord. But that was just the beginning of this introduction to what's going to be the tribulation, this wonderful beauty, this wonderful acknowledging of Jesus as the king and as the one who is the great judge. He's sitting on the throne. Uh, so it's, it's really a very interesting picture that's presented here. But today, the emphasis is on, on the book. And, and uh, I say the book, but almost everybody knows that the picture that someone would have read during that time was not of a book. People didn't really read books like books. They read scrolls. And so we're going to picture that as a scroll. It's one of those Hebrew scrolls. With, there you have Hebrew writing, but it probably would have been Greek writing, John writing in the New Testament. It would have been a scroll like that. So it's really interesting to look at. And when you look at the translation of the word, that's what it really comes out to. So let's take a look. The initial description of the scroll. So let's look at the scripture and actually jump down. It's chapter 5. And um, let me open up my Bible. I've, I want to I encourage you again to bring your Bibles and follow along in your scriptures. I am going to have the text up here, but I think it's so good for us to have the... Uh, the scripture in front of us. So verse one says, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back. Now it says the book in the King James, but the translation really should have said scroll written within and on the, the back sealed with seven seals. So we've already looked at the throne room. You come into the throne room and there is Jesus sitting on the throne. And we are really going to, we may get a glimpse of the Trinity at the same time because we're seeing the person on the throne and then we're seeing the person that will take the scroll. It's one and the same person. 
Uh, but it, it, it's kind of different outlooks. And we're going to see Jesus as the lion. And we're going to see Jesus as the lamb. So there is multiple views of our Savior, which is not surprising because he is the great and almighty king. He is the great and omniscient, omnipotent God. And so it's not surprising for us to observe that. So as we see this, written on both sides, it says on the back, it was actually a scroll, like I said before. But another thing that we notice, not only was it written on the back side, but we see these seven seals. And you can see these are seals. Now, at one point in my life, I think my mom was doing scrapbooking. And she thought it would be really cool to buy me a, 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 like a... A, a, a monogram with E on it. And, uh, and, and she used to sign her letters with that. And so she would, she would use that, you know, and a lot of times it would be a ring. People would seal. And this is how the scroll was sealed with these seven seals. Again, we've already talked about that seven, which is the, the number of God, the number of heaven, seven. Uh, it, it, that's the symbol that it takes on. So we think of that. But also, we've also talked about the seven spirits many, many times. And that's a sign of the Holy Spirit. And that seven, again, that, yeah, you could say a million if you wanted to. But that seven is that all-encompassing omnipresence of the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit that works in our lives all the time. So that seven seals, that's what it's representing. And, those, and there's some other things we'll look at too. Uh, sealed with seven. This is what Barclay said. He was a, a, a Bible scholar. God's will, his final sentiment of the affairs of the universe. In other words, what is in this scroll that's so fantastic? What could it be? Some people would say, well, it's the Old Testament or the New Testament. Or some people would say, well, it's uh, the book of Revelation, which all could be. That scroll, that's what it could be. Maybe the Revelation. But... A lot of people say, no, what it is, it is like the last will and testament of mankind, of the world. The scroll, because we're about to look at the tribulation period. We're about to see the end times that are just poured out before us. So he says, this is final settlement of the affairs of the universe. This is based on the idea that customary under Roman law, wills were sealed with seven seals each from a witness to the validity of the will. Walbert also said, Roman law required a will to be sealed seven times as illustrated in the wills left by Augustus and Vespasian for their successors. This is like a last will and testament of the world. The last will of God for the world. Kind of an interesting thing. Wouldn't it be great if God sent us a scroll with his will on it for us for the future? Now I'm 58 so, 58, right, sir? Yeah, okay. I was stuck with her. Yeah. We're, we're battling out, trying to see who's going to get to 60 first, but I think she's going to beat me. But, but wouldn't it be great? Like Caleb is a young man. So, wouldn't it be great if God would say, here, I'm going to give you my will for you for the next 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. What's going to happen? What's going to be God's will for you? What's going to be in the future? Uh, you know, and, and you think about it. Young people are always trying to find the will of God. I remember going to a singles retreat at Ironwood, and we studied a book called Decision Making and the Will of God, which is kind of this, this guy is a believer. He wrote this book, but he, he wrote this very kind of, kind of like mystery kind of thing about the will of God. So in other words, instead of looking at God's will and the sovereignty of God in our lives, kind of taking a Calvinist kind of approach to things, he took a different kind of approach. His approach was, you know, just do God's will. Just live for him. Just, just love him. Just, you know, and then just make decisions and, and don't really worry about trying to find God's will or trying to maybe look at circumstances or look at different things that happen in your life that point you towards finding God's will. He kind of said, don't let that worry you. So just make decisions. And if you're trying to live right, then it's going to work out okay. And he gives this illustration. It's the famous one from this book. It was very controversial when I was a kid, especially for singles. We all were like, what? You know, like, wow, can you believe what he said? And you're all like, goodness gracious, because he would say, hey, if there's three people that you want to marry, just flip a coin. You know, just 
just take them and see who looks the most beautiful and just go for it. You know, like, whatever. He, in, instead of like saying, instead of like saying, I'm going to take my time and you know, maybe God's going to do some things or conversations I have with those girls, you know, and God's going to, God's going to give me this like good feeling or he's going to direct me. He's going to, he's going to give me a certain uh, direction through circumstances, you know, like, and, and that's what I've always been taught when I was younger about God's will. Look at circumstances, look at teaching, talk to people that are wiser and know more than you, and, and say, what do you think about those three girls that I want to marry? You know, that never happened to me, by the way. Sarah came into my life, and she was the right one. It was easy. Amen. But, you know, I didn't have, like, I didn't have to flip a coin. But what's so interesting is one of the, like, one of the great mentors in my life, I remember talking to his wife, and she had two people she wanted to marry. One of them was him. And she used to say that. She, I didn't know what to do. They, all, they both were spiritual. They both loved God. They both were amazing. They both loved me. They both, and I didn't know what to do. You know, but then she talked about how God showed her the right place for him. But I, for me, it was Sarah who came along and she was the right one. Thank God. But, uh, but anyway, so this is the will uh, point. I went way too far on this point. But the point being, God said, wouldn't it be great if God would give us a scroll to tell us what the rest of our life is going to be like? That's not the way it works. But here, that's what's happening. God's giving some insight about to the will and testament of the rest of mankind. He's going to show something about the tribulation. He's going to show something about the judgments. And he wants us as believers to take it. You know, take it. Like, in your, when you were younger, trying to find God's will and looking into the scripture and God gives you this passage that helps you understand maybe something you didn't think you would be able to or a circumstance comes in your life that's an open door. Listen to God. And listen to God about the end times. We're going to read some things about the tribulation. It's coming. And there are some things going on in our world, evil things. Some of the stuff that's being accepted by people as right is just unbelievable today. It's unbelievable what's going on. And we need to know that. And we need to make it, take it seriously. So we want to, yeah, if we take it seriously, man, we're going to want to tell everyone about it. Hey, get right. Get right with God. Give your heart to Jesus. Be in the kingdom. Avoid the tribulation. Be in the rapture. That's, that's, that's why all of this stuff is happening, this wonder that we see here. It's the last will and testament of the world. Getting the scroll, verses 2 through 5, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. They couldn't even look at it. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into the altar. Lots of symbolism here. Not necessarily, I mean, the pictures are vivid, okay? The pictures are vivid, but, but it's, this is speaking of Jesus. So they're symbols of Jesus because, yeah, they're symbols picturing what we might think about Jesus in our minds. So a strong angel, first of all, comes out. A strong angel proclaims, who is worthy? This could be Gabriel, the messenger Think about what Gabriel did. Remember when he came to Mary and then the dream with Joseph? Like the messenger angel. It's the messenger angel. It very possibly could be Gabriel. I think that's most likely. And no one can open, it says. No man in heaven nor on earth can open that book. And it's a really, it's a real dilemma presented here. And I know, you know, you know Jesus is going to be able to open the book. But the picture, I think, that's being painted here as we look at the end times, just remember, the only way to heaven is through Jesus. Amen. 
The only one that can open the book is Jesus. There's not another way. There's no, there's no other way given among men whereby we must be saved, it says in Acts. And, and you hear me say this a lot, but I'm going to keep saying it because when I open up the scripture and I say, okay, I'm going to study a book, whether it's Genesis, whether it's Philippians, whether it's the Gospels, whether it's Revelation, guess what I keep hearing? Jesus is the only way of salvation. He's the only redeemer. All the other religions have another way, another formula. Jesus is, it, you know, the grace of Jesus Christ. That's the only, only way. So he wept much because he's thinking about it. Folks, you know, we should weep much when people say, man, I'm, I'm relying on my good works. I'm relying on, you know, uh, trying to reach karma or reach, you know, the, this state of, of unity with, with the world. And, you know, we should weep like, and say, man, no. That's not the way. It's through Jesus. He's the only way. Those are false thoughts. And uh, he wept much. Why did he weep? Because he was thinking about that. I really believe John was going, wow, there's all these. Think about it. He, it's the Greek Empire. It's the, or it's the Roman Empire with all the Greek thinking and all the, all the people coming up with these different philosophies, you know. Epicureanism and Stoicism and all these, you know, they, they had all their ideas, but they weren't the way. I mean, what did they call in the New Testament? They called it the way, didn't they? Not on, it's not a mistake. We cannot redeem ourselves through good works, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and ruining, renewing of the Holy Ghost, nor through our family, nor through rituals. It's another reminder here in the book of Revelation that Jesus is the only way. Another reminder. Then Jesus came. One of the elders, by the way, there's the lion. One of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose those seven seals. Bible scholar Trapp says that a lion is fitting image of our Messiah for the excellency of his strength, for his heroical spirit, for his principality. The lion is the king of beasts. For his vigilancy, the lion sleepeth with open eyes. The one worthy to open the scroll, verses 6 and 7. Behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne. So again, there was the, that second point was, okay, there's the seals. Who's going to open the scroll? No one can do it, and we know only Jesus can do it. And now we're going to get the description of that. And behold, lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So we're getting this very vivid picture and this description of Almighty God, the only one who can save. The only one who can redeem is Almighty God. But now it is a lamb. Now I just said Almighty God and then I said it's a lamb that hath been slain. One of the amazing pictures of our God is the humility of him. As we read about him in the scripture, and I've been saying a lot of glorious things so far, haven't I? We just read the, the lion. And then right after it says the lion, it says, wait a minute. He's also a lamb. Another symbol. A lamb that hath been slain. Powerful, but in sacrifice we see here. Slain, as it had been slain. As if now, in the act of being offered, this is, a very, this is very remarkable. So important is the sacrificial offering of Christ. This is Clark, Clark's uh, rendition of this. In the sight of God, that he is still represented as being in the very act of pouring out his blood for the offenses of man. This gives great advantage to faith. When any soul comes to the throne of grace, he finds sacrifice there provided for him to offer to God. Thus all succeeding generations find they have the continual sacrifice ready and the newly shed blood. That's an interesting... Here we are in Revelation and we're still getting... It's not, it's not like, well, you know, go back to the cross... That was a long time ago, 3,000 years ago, however many years, or 2,000, 20, 20 something, 100 years ago. And, and that happened a long time ago. Here we are in Revelation. It's the things of the future, but we're still remembering the Lamb of God, the sacrifice. 
And it's not like what some would teach. Well, that's because he's continually, you know, every every week at the at, at church service, we you know we're going to sacrifice his body over and over. And over. That's not what it's talking about. But the remembrance, it's the remembrance. You know, if anything, we should have taken communion today, which we need to do again. We need to do that. Maybe we'll do it next week. We should have had communion today. Because here, what's it talking about? The sacrifice is brought up again. Before we go into the tribulation, remember the sacrifice. Remember Jesus. Remember the Redeemer, the one that's getting you out of this, that's about to rapture you away from the tribulation. And that's what we're seeing here. Wow. The seven eyes, horns and spirits. Horns, what does that give us about the picture of God? The omnipotence, the horns of a, of a great and mighty uh, ram, let's say, but that omnipotence, that all-powerfulness. Eyes, all-knowing, omnipresence, the seven eyes. He, he could have put a million eyes of the omnipresence of Jesus, of God. The spirit, the om, om, or omniscience, I'm sorry. The spirit is the omnipresence. The uh, all-knowing is the eyes, omniscience. And the spirit is the omnipresence of God. I know you hear those omnis and they kind of go all together. <laughs> Omnipotent, all-powerful. Omniscience, all-knowing. And omnipresence, um, present everywhere. That's God. He's the only one like that. He's the only one. Jesus is the only one who could take the scroll, like I mentioned before. He came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Okay, again, we already already said Jesus is the one on the throne. Jesus is the one taking the, the scroll. So here we might see the Trinity, the deity, taking from the scroll, to Jesus taking it from the Father. The worship of the worthy one is verses 8 through 14. So now we get into the worship of this one that we have mentioned. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, four and twenty elders, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So now we're seeing this worship of the worthy one. And it's a beautiful one. It's one of great sound. It says they had harps. Golden vials full of odors, the incense of a king we see, which are the prayers of the saints. The 24 elders are there. They're falling down. And that's the picture that we see of the worship of the Lord. All the ones at the throne fell down and worshiped with incense. With a new song, they sang. And they sang, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, has redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on them. There's a lot there. Ladies and gentlemen, you're a child of the king. You are a priest. You are a king. You're a prince. And it is part of our new song. Thou art worthy. Now, let's take a little bit of time on this. What about the redemption? Because ultimately, the mention of Jesus as the sacrificial lamb reminds us, reminds us, it reminds us to continually remember his redemption. Jesus was the price of redemption. Jesus was the worker of redemption. Jesus made this great redemption. Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. It's a great one. It's offered to all. Nobody is held back. It's offered to all. Jesus made this a lofty redemption because it makes us kings, it makes us priests before a holy God. Jesus made the redemption for the future, we shall reign on the earth. All of that is encompassed in those verses. Jesus, the Redeemer, the one who paid the penalty. And then the angel song, verses 11 and 12, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. It doesn't really say they're singing here, but I'm, sing- I'm thinking that it was a song. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of, I don't know what that is, because 10,000 times 10,000 I think is a million. So then and thousands and thousands, so maybe it could be even more. I don't know what it was. It's a lot. We, we hear all these angels. 
saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. This is from the Messiah. It's from the book of Isaiah. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory. That's the angel's song. Kind of like glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The shepherds have heard the angel song. I'm jealous. I wish I had been there. Because that was, I really love good choir music, and it it this choir is like no choir you've ever heard. The greatest choirs of the world, nothing compared to the angels' song. Like, oh wow. I am amazed at what I'm seeing and hearing in these verses. The angel song is what we hear. Do you know one thing though? The angels, they don't need redemption. You ever notice that? We, we don't redeem angels. And I don't know all the, I don't understand all. That's one of those mysteries. But we know some of the angels fell. But when they fell, that was the end. No more chances for those angels that fell. The demons, Satan's angels, there's nothing of it. But the ones that stayed loyal to him, in a sense, that was, their, that was their final and only choice at that point. And they will always and be forever loyal to the king. Now, again, can I explain that in a reasonable understanding? Not really. But I know it to be true. Because there's no redemption for the angels. They are loyal to the king. They are with him. They're with him. They are... They are loyal to him, but they don't need to be redeemed. We have this unique situation, a different kind of relationship with Jesus than the angels do. We need to be redeemed. And we can understand that love. We can understand that sacrifice. Angels are a little bit different, but it doesn't, it's still, they, they still give praise to the Lord as we look at this scene before the tribulation. Not of redemption, angels never sing the song of their own redemption because they are not in need of it. Ten times, ten, I'm pretty sure 10,000 times 10,000 a million. I think it is. Worthy to receive power, riches, blessing, wisdom, strength, and honor. And then we go on, look at verses 13 and 14. So we go from all those in the throne room giving praise to the Lord. Then it goes even further. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I sing. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So you get this picture. And I don't know if we're transformed to even past the tribulation at this point. Where everybody's going to bow their knee. It's possible that's true. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe there will be a moment of everybody acknowledging God. It doesn't mean they were redeemed. It doesn't mean they're giving their life to God. But they're acknowledging him. And what it reminds me of this, and I'm going to end with this passage. Philippians chapter 2. Because we go to chapter 2 and we read about Jesus, the suffering Savior, don't we? Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. We're talking about Jesus at the cross. We're talking about Jesus, the suffering Savior, the Lamb of God, the Lamb that hath been slain. And then it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. This is the same passage. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I don't know if those events are exact same, but they're very similar. Here it says that they will confess that Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean they're going to give their hearts to Jesus, but they will know that he is Lord. Not their Lord. Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Lord of heaven. He's the Lord of this world. They'll understand that, but he will not be the personal Lord of their lives. The people missed out. You don't want to miss out. 
Now, I'm talking to people at home. I don't know if there's somebody here that doesn't have that personal relationship with Jesus, that believes God's word to be true, and you're trusting the word of God that says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Maybe there's somebody like that that doesn't have that taken care of for sure. If you don't really have it for sure, what's going to happen someday? You're going to go along and people are going to start talking about other, other truths. And you're just going to go, well, yeah, I like that truth. I'm going to go with that too. No, if you give your heart to Jesus, if you have the Son in your life and you're trusting God's Word as the sole foundation of truth, you're not going to be swayed by those things. It won't happen. There's only, you know, the truth. There's the truth. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and God will cleanse your heart from your sin and make you redeemed like those redeemed that are mentioned here in Revelation. That's my challenge for you. Get wrapped up like these ones were with that which is in the scroll, the will of the future, the will of God for the future. Get wrapped up in that because you're going to want to tell people because you know that. You're going to want to say, hey, be redeemed. Be a part of the redemption that Jesus can give. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for your love and your work in our lives. We're thankful for the word of God, which has provided for us the truth. Lord, may we believe it and trust it. Trust you for it. Lord, we pray for those who don't know Jesus, have not bent their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. The plan of salvation is not a hard one. Recognizing our sin, recognizing the only solution for our sin is believing on Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And believing in that and that grace that it wipes and makes us, wipes our sin free, clean and makes us righteous before a holy God in the act of believing. We pray for those who don't have that taken care of. I mean, like truly in their hearts that they would give their lives to Jesus and believe the word of God and be a part of God's family. It's what it's, what it's being. Pray for those that are struggling with this concept that we pray they give their heart to Jesus. Lord, it would challenge our hearts, I know it has mine, of being in the, in the understanding, walking in the understanding that Jesus could come back anytime. And that tribulation, which we're going to look at next week, which is terrible. Those judgments we can, be, can be avoided if we trust Christ. Lord, work in our hearts. Challenge us, we pray. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.